Oh, they're so inspiring hearing that, Dina. Uh, yeah, no, they're wonderful. I mean, they've just given their whole lives over to this. It's well, so and so incredible. have you. And um, I guess what we wanted to do initially was to try and, uh, for those people that have, uh, have been reading your book earlier this month or maybe have come in from a busy day, is to go back to the sort of busting some of the myths around this this crazy uh, well, this world and the crisis that that uh, that we're in at the moment, that we we on the outside sort of see and then get drawn back in to try and like refocus ourselves. So um, we see these sort of myths in the media a lot. So if if you can help us cut through them with your experience and work, that'd be really helpful. So the first myth, and Ben and I will just jump back and forth. The first myth we've got is the crisis is over. Well, the refugees, I mean, we've been we've been creating refugees since, you know, for hundreds and thousands of years. There's no one moment when refugees began to, you know, migrate around the world. As long as there's wars, as long as there's po poverty, as long as there's climate change, there's going to be refugees. So, no, nothing is over. Um, we how we deal with refugees is a fundamental question in our lives. It's a moral dilemma that we will always face and we have to continue to think about. Um, it just happened, you know, 2015 was a moment where the media made a lot of us more aware of it. But, you know, this has been the question of my life and it's been, you know, going on for... Number two, we can neatly separate refugees from economic migrants. Hmm. No, I, <laughs> you know, there is there is this spectrum of migration that I actually kind of I drew it out once for a, a journalist who I was talking to, because so often um, people not only confuse the terminology, but they do believe that you can draw some kind of line, you know, but there's a spectrum that, you know, one issue bleeds into another. And, you know, at one end, you have people who um you know, like go to another country easily for a job, people we call expats. And at another end are refugees whose lives are in clear, clear danger. They have proof and they can show, you know, some kind of paper and say, here I am and be accepted. But in between is this vast gray space, starting with the kinds of refugees who um, can't necessarily prove that they're refugees so quickly because they had to cut and run. They had to run to save their lives. They couldn't pick up the proof, you know, and they're not necessarily accepted. They're asylum seekers or undocumented and they're not um, called refugees right away and then and but beyond that there's this even more murky gray area of people whose lives are indeed in danger and I think that the people who wrote the Geneva Convention would call them refugees too but because of little loopholes in the law and countries wanting to turn people away you know particular words in the language of the Geneva Convention agreement is uh, interpreted by the legal you know bodies in various countries differently so that they can reject people who should be refugees and they, those people are often called economic migrants so for example in um let's say you're doing your interview and let's say you ran away from a gang you know who was going to kill you for a number of reasons and one of those reasons let's say was because you were in a particular social group or category that they didn't like. Well, that actually is one of the reasons that you can be counted as a refugee. But let's say you happen to mention in the interview that you also didn't have enough money to pay them off. Well, they can just count that as an economic problem. They can say, well, that's a money issue, isn't it? You couldn't pay the guy who wanted money from you and you're being extorted. That's not a refugee issue. You're an economic migrant. Can you imagine how, like, how awful it is to nitpick on something like that? Um, you know, to cast someone in a different category when the reality is that their life is in danger and the people, you know, the, the Geneva Convention was written with this central idea of non-refoulement, which means we don't send people back into danger so that they can be killed, you know, and yet we do because we put them in a different category. And then, of course, there's the next group. We lost D Dina. Dina's Dina when she checked in earlier, she said, I'm in a oh, she's coming back. Um we I just you just can you hear me? You froze you froze with your arms aloft. Um <laughs> Hello? No, delivering the point. We lost oh, you we you lost you me? for a few seconds. <laughs> yeah, I do that. Well, was I okay, so I think I was getting to the people who are maybe whose lives are in danger for economic reasons who are, maybe do count as economic migrants but you know isn't isn't ha dying of hunger also a kind of danger we should maybe look at um you know isn't having no opportunity and a whole life wasted um you know 
something that we should perhaps you know take into account when we when we um, you know decide to show mercy, decide to show some um, compassion to people. So, but but then there's people who fall yeah, very much abs- in the category I, of economic This is a recurring migrants, theme that we've heard in your story, obviously, um, throughout this crisis, but also in other aspects yeah. of society. We've heard it this week in this ridiculous back and forth between hungry school children and the government deciding where to spend their money, like there's, a, there's even a decision to be made. Um, and, the, and it's the humanization of these things. Something that I think we 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 often talk about in this community is is uh, is, is sort of like the abu- where the, the abundance of compassion that humans being, but feeling like they're unable to keep giving. So there's this fatigue, especially when there's a slight gap between the hu- the human the emotional. There's an emotional gap between the story. Um, and you even talk about this a little bit, I guess, through your grandmother's story and 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 her journey. So how do we overcome, or how have you managed to overcome? your own compassion fatigue with having been through it all yourself um, to keep, to keep going back and saying, no, we we need to uh, treat everyone, especially those in crisis as human beings. Yeah. Well, first of all, I think we need to give ourselves a break for having that that compassion fatigue. We're human, you know? So how do I get over my compassion fatigue? I don't, I'm human. I have a lot of ugly moments. And I think the first step for me has been acknowledging that and writing about it honestly and saying, you know what? I'm a former refugee who sometimes asks like ugly questions, you know, and sometimes, you know, doubts people's stories and sometimes finds myself, you know, thinking things that I shouldn't because I, I think, I don't think I want to draw a line between the good people and the bad people. You know, that's not the way to solve this problem. I think we need to understand the human sources for all of these different sorts of complicated feelings. Um, but I think another thing is for us to engage different different parts of ourselves. So it's not just about my personal compassion mm. or your personal compassion, although that is a part of it. We also need to engage in th- philosophical questions like what do we owe to each other, right? What, what do we have and what are we entitled to? Are we entitled to everything that we're born with? You know, um, so, you know, I, I often talk about this mental exercise and um, that the philosopher John Rawls, you know, he talks about the original position. You know, he talks about this idea that if you were, um, you know, if before you were born, if before you knew what body you would be born into, you could create a world, what kind of world would you create? Well, you would probably calculate that you're likely to be poor, that you're likely to be, you know, somewhere in the third world. And you would make make sure that the people's worse off you know, the worst people no, in clear. the world, the worst pe- off people in the world aren't that, you know, um, bad off. I mean, I'm being very inarticulate here, <laughs> but 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 that's what you would do. And so that's the kind of world we should aim to to create. Mm. So I guess what I would say is, yes, we should feel a lot of compassion. We should read the individual stories. We should make room in our hearts, but we should also make room in our minds. And we should think about how these problems have been created and, um, you know, just these things are moral dilemmas that require logic and thinking and, and, and engagement with a path. I really love that as an option <laughs> when you're um, feeling emotionally when uh, either over-engaged or disengaged to go, well, another. look, you've and got the, you're the fortunate active. ones. I mean, we're in a, we're a bloody book club we're <laughs> to be like intellectually curious about the world, right? And have the resources to spend time and money on that. So, so to go and do a philosophical like exploration of like, what would a world look like if, which is more exactly. sort of entrepreneurial and idealistic is, is a really energizing way to think about it. So I, I love that distinction. Um, ben, have we got any questions coming in yet from our, from our 181 yeah. RBC members who are following along? We do have some more coming through. I'll take the latest one from Kaisha. You discuss the concept of the good immigrant in your book. <laughs> do you think the alienation of refugees and immigrants has become more common or easier for people in recent years since events such as Trump becoming president and Brexit? Yeah, very good question. Thank you so much. And and yes, I do. I think one of it's not just it didn't start with Trump and Brexit, although that was, you know, a particular low moment. But I think with the Internet, with this generation's ability, you know, to just express themselves so freely, um, I think some some 
opinions and thoughts and feelings that were maybe unspeakable before when we had to face people who's, a, you know, when we gave them an opinion, um, are now just able to be out there, you know, legitimized, if, if facelessly, you know, we can anonymously put some awful things out there. And so it's given voice to groups of people who maybe would not have been listened to so easily before. And I think this um, blaming of refugees and, and um, you know, disdain for refugees and the notion that maybe, you know, we as, or not we, but you as, as native born people are entitled to all the things that you know, you're born with in your country. Those kinds of ideas have been fed by the internet and, and by people being able to find each other to share those despicable ideas. And then of course you bring in people like Trump, you bring in some of the other- um, Yeah, and, and Jared building on that was asking, yeah, like many of us, we want to wanna blame somebody, but he's saying, do you like feel responsibilities for this ongoing crisis lie in the hands of governments or the hands of individuals, or is it, is it not clear? For the for the crisis for the refugee crisis. Um, wait, responsibility for the. Well, I mean, I we are we all share responsibility. I mean, every time we turn away from things that are far away from us, every time we turn off, you know, the news to more drowning children in the Aegean, every time we don't lobby our governments, every time we, you know, kind of secretly vote for the person who gives us a little bit more economic advantage, um, those those things add up. And I think it's really really important to understand our own role. Um, you know, as individuals, what are we giving money to? Who are we voting for? What sort of things do we spend our time lobbying for? What message do we send to the people in power? And then of course, that's what the governments respond to. So I think it's really very, very important for us to speak out, for us to vote, for us to um, you know, make sure that those in power know that they will lose that power if, you know, if awesome. they behave in a way- uh, Another media myth, sentence, just quickly, and, and, and from our side. And, you know, in accordance Asylum with seekers and refugees get large handouts from the state. No. Um, well, you know, refugees at the beginning, when they first arrive, when they're accepted, they get something like $30 a week, 30 pounds a week to live on in the UK. It's, it's, it's something very small, barely enough to live on. Um, and if you look at the long term, um, most refugees actually pay that many fold in taxes because these are people who have lives, who have professions, who have things that they are desperate to get back to. They're desperate to give back to the countries that have taken them in and to find their identity and professions again. So it is no surprise to me that they end up earning a lot of money in the, in the long term and paying back you know, many fold the money they received at the beginning in order to start, you know? So, um, so these are not handouts. These are a tr transitional, you know, very small payments so people can survive and pick up their lives again. Um, I, um, but, but I have to say that even though I'm making this economic, mm -hmm. you know, argument about refugees, I have to say, I find being, having to make it also really, really tough because again, refugees are people who were about to die, you know, whose lives were in danger, who could have been, you know, they could have lost their children, they could have lost their lives, they could have lost a lot of things. And so it was, it's a humanitarian duty for us to take them in, no matter what they cost us, you know? Yeah, and yet it, we are forced to make these kinds no, of no, arguments. No, no, go, go like, ahead, oh, please. Well, they pay it back, you know? But really, is this what we want to be asking? Do they pay it back? Um, as for, yeah. And, and as for economic migrants, I mean, I, I um, you know, I, they, they come for opportunity, for economic opportunity, which means they want to work, which means that they want to build businesses. They want to be a part and, of the and community. And you're already so, in a, because um, of your the, remarkable they, work, by and, definition, uh, passion are, to, to are change things to for the better, you're already in an influential to. position. Um, and by the way, your writing, I know you've, you've written fiction before, and so it, it didn't surprise me that, that it was such a, as well as dramatic but easy to turn the page book um because of your turn of phrase um but i want to if you were in an even more powerful position uh a, a political leader in 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 europe what 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 policies it what's what's the first thing you're going to change in order to make things better i mean there's, there's always this sort of one side or the other are you going to open open the door policy or are we going to shut them all out which is obviously we know is 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 you can't go either way. What's what do you do? What are the first things you do when you're in power? 
Well, you can't. Yeah. No. First thing I would do is I would allow people who are waiting for asylum to work. You know, I would not make them right now, you know, there are rules in the UK that say, you know, until you've been given certain papers and rights to work, you have to sit idly. Um, you, you have to take, you know, that 30 pounds a week. And even if you do charity work just to pass the time, you um, could, you know, um, be in violation of the rules, which means you could jeopardize your, you know, your receiving uh, the right to stay. So um, I would get rid of that. I would allow people to work. I would allow people to get back their dignity, their identity, their sense of self, and to give back to the, the country that they're living in, how, however they're living here, um, through taxes. So that's, that's something that's just positive for everyone. Um, I would make sure that there is um, some you know, standardized, you know, government-funded um, education in the camps and in all of the waiting places, because we can't put the burden, all of the burden, on these charities. They, they do such amazing work, and they give so much of themselves, um, and, you know, they campaign so much and raise money, but this is the job of the governments who, I guess, whose actions throughout history have displaced these people in the first place. Um, so I would make sure that there's, um, there's education there, that the wait times are not, you know, so incredible as years and years and years. And then I would also um, educate the gatekeepers, the asylum officers who are doing the interviews. Um, I wouldn't give them quotas of people to turn away. I wouldn't give them checklists of how to listen to a story and how to like discredit it with some tiny little detail. I would teach them to listen to stories the way stories are meant to be listened to. Um, and I would teach them what the Geneva Convention is and that it's their job. Their job is fundamentally a humanitarian job to protect the Geneva Convention, to protect people whose lives are in danger. Their job isn't like bean counting and checking boxes and turning people away and then bragging about the number of people they turned away. I mean, this is this kind of stuff that happens in the Home Office and in the... Um, well, the, uh, uh, interesting, the very first one so thing that you mentioned I, I would, um, um, around the opportunity those, to work, Sky has just shared right the Lift the Ban campaign. So. Um, <laughs> Working trying to lift the banner refugees to work while they wait for their asylum to be approved. So that's something we can support uh, straight away. Lifttheban.co.uk. Um, it sounds to me, Dina, like <laughs> that last two minutes was literally a manifesto that we were all nodding along to. Yeah. Um, are, on, in terms of your personal journey, where it, what's what's going on in your life and, and work at the moment? I know the pandemic has obviously changed things, but uh, are you aspiring working towards getting into a position of more influence and power? So nosy, so nosy, I know, but you, you, you drew us in with your manifesto. Well, wow, that's a big question, Ben. Um, I, no, I do love, <laughs> no, no, I, 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 I am a writer and I love to write and I'm writing another book, uh, you know, that's again focused on, on the vulnerable people of the world and it's about who gets believed, not just refugees, but who gets believed and disbelieved and where the power lies in terms of credibility and, 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 um, and you know, um, you know, people's opinions and stories and all of that. So, um, and I will continue write, to write fiction and nonfiction, um, you know, that focuses on injustices and vulnerable people of the world. And and who knows, I think in the long term, I do want to get very much involved in uh, actual refugee work um, and to do something that changes policy. Um, that's really important. I don't, I don't want to just sit, you know, on my perch and say how things should be. I want to get my hands dirty, you know, just... Um, like all of the others. Right now I am, you know, uh, I, I'm mostly quarantining with my family because of the pandemic. We've escaped to a little village um, because Paris is locking down again and, and my partner is from a little right, village It's a powerful France, pen you so, hold, Dina. Um, um, ben, what other questions do we have? Right We've got a few more right minutes. Now, the best I can There's do loads is of good ones, so to be honest. Doing, um, on, and one maybe on to ground it a little stories. bit more personally as well as sort of bigger policy from Domini. You mentioned that one thing we should do is show our humblest self. Could you give some examples of how to do this? Dumini says it feels so easy to take things for granted as a native born that might make it difficult to be as humble as we possibly could be.
Yeah, you know, I think I think the fact that you ask a question like that means that many of your natural instincts would probably be good. You know, I think people don't come in with a lot of curiosity at first about refugees. And that's one thing they come from like the perch of the giver, like I'm going to do some good work, I'm going to knock on the door of this, you know, person, or I'm going to um, offer them some help. But I think as kind as that is, um, that's not really enough to break a barrier, because it, it puts you on a level above them and it makes them feel shame. You know, shame at the position that they're in, shame that they have less, shame that they are not part of the community and don't know the culture. So I think one thing you can do, you know, to be humble and to approach refugees and immigrants and people who've just arrived humbly is to be curious about them and their lives before they were refugees or, or migrants. Like, who are you? What do you love? You know, what is your food? What is your music? What are your stories? And just see how quickly you forget the circumstances that brought them there. I mean, if, if language is not an issue, talk to them exactly like you would a new neighbor, you know, because that's what they are. And then, um, and then share the same of yourself and try to find something, you know, aside from this giving, you know, um, that you have in common and build relationships based on that. Because all that they need is to be accepted into a community, to be useful and to be, um, allowed to forget that they were refugees so that they can have their identity and dignity Thank back. Thank you. Um, Great answer. And, and just building on that to, to wrap up the conversation, like Omar has shared money, a, a personal story with a question. Omar says, how can we effectively decouple the definition of refugees from their economic and social status and focus on the fact that they need protection? Some people think that refugees have to be poor and underprivileged. Personally, being a refugee, I found that some don't believe I am a refugee just because I earn a good living and, a for and are fortunate enough to come from an educated background. On the other hand, if they're like you, as if those those who are not educated are not worth saving at all. Um, Omar, there's a, there's a whole story to share here, but the, what, what's your reflection on, on that? Well, I mean, this is this is so complicated because um, you're right. You know, I come from a family of doctors and we were refugees. I mean, in, of course, most refugees in the process do lose everything because if you've escaped the government and they're trying to kill you, you're not, you know, wiring funds out of the country. Um, but, you know, a lot of refugees do come with big educations, with, you know, incredible past things that they've done and accomplished. And, and I think it's really very, very important to just read the definition of what a refugee is, according to the Geneva Convention. You know, it's someone who's like is in danger for political reason, for, you know, religious reasons, because they're a particular social group. Um, you know, there's five actually categories of, of reasons why you could you could be persecuted and become a refugee. And that means that those people are across an economic spectrum, across a spectrum of education. Um, you know, and um, and so I think just understanding that definition will help decouple that. Um, but of course, the reality is really complicated. People overlap. There are poor refugees who need to, to, to escape, but they also um, will do better in the West. You know, so it's really very hard to separate that group. Um, for that, I think one of the most important things we can do is to um, give money to organizations that provide legal help to people seeking asylum. Because one thing that ends up happening to refugees is that the rich educated ones know exactly what to say. You know, they can help themselves. They understand what the Geneva Convention rules are. Whereas the poor ones will immediately say the wrong thing or the ones without an education will immediately say the wrong thing and damn their case. Okay. So it's very, very important for everyone to have access to lawyers. And that's another policy change I would make, by the way. You come in the door, you speak first to free counsel. And oh, Dina, there's so, so much value you've given um, us in, you know, in the last half a, hour. Um, and of course, a, a whole lot more in your, in your wonderful book. You. Um, thank you for your work and for writing your story um, and, and for everything that you've been doing um, in terms of inspiring and educating people. Uh, we will do our best as a community to to follow your lead.